Hello and welcome to Ask GMBN Tech. This is the show where we can hopefully, in fact, I always say hopefully, that we will, we will answer your questions on mountain bike tech. So if you've got your own question, get into the comments using the hashtag AskGMBN and we can hope, hopefully feature it on the show. So first question this week is from Steve from Fort Worth. Steph from, I don't know where the space is. I'm gonna say Steve. And they say, hi guys, I recently fitted a new tire and rode it for a while. I liked it and decided to buy the exact same one for the front. Cool. But when they fitted the new front tire, they noticed that it was a few millimeters narrower than the rear, despite it being the exact same brand model size paired to an identical rim. They were wondering if the tire rear tire had been fitted first, could it maybe have stretched and it's inflated. So tires will stretch just a little bit. Like you said, a few millimeters, not much. Um, Maybe if that wasn't the case, you know, sometimes depending on model year, like there've been certain brands that one year, the same tire, the same width, the same spec was just narrower. I don't know if maybe they were changing factory or something, um, but tires will have a bit, a bit of movement. And also it depends that day, was it the same pressure? Because if you had one just seated and you had it at 45 PSI and you have your rear one that you've been riding on or maybe 25 psi that will be different as well um so they will stretch just a little bit just a few millimeters and um even if it hasn't it's not defective i wouldn't imagine um it's just not not the same size as the rear but maybe the rear's wrong maybe you've got one that's slightly bigger than normal and one that's slightly smaller than normal but both are perfectly adequate you know in terms of quality control but they look worse because they kind of exaggerate each other but anyway on to the next question from Owen. And he says, he used to work as a wheel builder at a UK based shop called Spa Cycles. Excellent. And he recently decided to build up a new wheel set for his reign. Perfect. Now he took a bit of head scratching to remember how to lace them. And this is a good question. Um, so basically he wants to know, he was taught to lace them asymmetrically. So without, but he basically wondered if it actually makes a difference to the strength of the wheel. And would you, would I, or would we build them asymmetrically? Um, so the way I build them, well, first up, does it make a difference? Probably not that much difference realistically, but what it probably makes a difference in it not. So for instance, when you've got, I've actually got a wheel here, you might have noticed sometimes on straight pull wheels, I've detentioned these spokes, sometimes they're not touching, sometimes they are. And where you position on straight pull wheels, for instance, and I'll come back to the question in hand, where you position the spoke holes, it basically, how much those two work against each other and how much tension that creates is gonna have a really big effect on how your wheel feels. So they don't always want them to be the stiffest possible and they don't always want them to be the most compliant possible. So in terms of when you get a wheel like this, which is a complete kind of package, they might be laced not the way that you think you would do it if you're building them by hand, but there's every chance the manufacturer did them in that way because they want to hit you know, a certain benchmark for compliance, for strength, etc. cetera. So um, that's my first point. In terms of what, um, what Owen means here in regards to lacing patterns. So when you have a driving force and a braking force, they operate on the wheel very differently. So the way, the technical language for you, Owen, is personally, I would build a rear wheel with a disc hub asymmetrically, and I would build a front wheel reverse symmetrically. So if symmetric is for a rimmed brake wheel on the rear, I'd build it all for braking forces on the front, which would be um, reverse symmetric, and I would build it asymmetrically on the rear. So an easy way to look at it is when you look at the hub, when you look at it straight, like I'm looking at this one, your spokes will be going to the left. Your outbound spokes will be going to the left. That is pretty much a foolproof way to do it. Um, you know, you do hear different things. Like there was the, I've heard two people say it, but both people have said it a different way. That imagine this was a rear wheel and this was your drive side. If you were in a downhill race and you were to send the chain over the back of the cassette, one way, I guess it would be outbound to the right, so going that way, would be more likely to kick out the chain. 
but like I said, I've been told it twice and they both said it was different ways. So how, how, much, um, <laughs> how much truth that holds, I'm not so sure. Um, but basically, if I was building my own wheels, I would go asymmetric on the rear, reverse symmetric on the front, and um, yeah, couldn't shut up then. So I'm sorry for just probably boring you to death there, Owen, but I hope you got your answer. So next question is from, sadly, a username I can't pronounce. Sorry about that. And um, they basically say, I have a SRAM EX1 cassette lying around, and I'm curious if an e-bike specific drivetrain, such as the EX1 system, would be able to get more miles without wearing out on a standard bike. So basically, e-bike componentry on a standard mountain bike. So this sometimes is done, actually. I know downhill teams running the Shimano um, e-bike chains because it's actually just the, kind of the chassis and the structure of the chain is so much stiffer. It does shift more predictably under large amounts of load, i.e. out the start gate. Um, maybe that also paired with um, the wider spacing of that EX1 cassette, it might give more um, reliable shifting under load, especially without a motor. Um, I don't know the exact figures. I do know anecdotally, I know people that have been able to get thousands of kilometers on an e-bike out on those EX1 cassettes. So I imagine they must be relatively, what's the word? Well, probably, probably they do suffer a bit of a weight penalty, I would imagine but they probably are very hard wearing. And yeah, if it's got the range and it's good for your riding, you're not really fussed about weight, then it sounds like a great, great plan. Yeah, it also really depends on, on so many things, you know, your riding style, how many how much power you put out, how gentle you are, where you ride, etc. But it's probably a safe bet to get some more miles than a standard cassette, at least. Next question is from Daniel Merg, and he says, Aloha, good start. Does the clutch on my rear derailleur hinder my rear suspension performance? Good question. After coming across a random YouTube video on the subject, I experimented on my 2015 Bronson. I switched off the clutch on the XT Mech and found the suspension to feel much more supple, plush and active with the clutch off, especially on small bump sensitivity. Have I fallen victim to an unvetted YouTube channel's influence? I think I could be on thin ice here. I'm just you know, <laughs> dreading carefully. Um, have I mind tricked myself or does the clutch actually prevent proper or natural suspension action in your opinion? Um, yes, yes, that's my answer, yes it does. Um, some bikes will suffer worse from it than others. Um, I think it basically, in my experience, it's basically gonna exaggerate things. You know, when with bikes, especially with more rearward axle paths, they can be vulnerable to certain problems and it's gonna just basically change that a bit. How much difference it makes, I don't know. I mean, I remember when, to be honest, I was quite tempted when Clutch Mex first came out, I thought, hmm, this isn't for me. I was gonna run top and bottom guide. But then it's like all the efficiency loss because they always just seem to just drag like nobody's business. It's a worthy trade-off, and I'm fully on the clutch mech thing, even though I was originally skeptical. Um, because, yeah, you know, as soon as, like, sometimes they, they kind of bed in or they wear a little bit, and you have to tighten them up, and just the noise. Oh, horrible. I think it's so distracting. <laughs> um, but, yeah, I think uh, not losing chains is worth it, but you are right. It will, if the, especially if it's a very, very tight clutch, will hinder performance a bit. Um, but performance is a relative term, I guess. So next question from Clicks G Cranks, and they say, hello, love the show. Nice. I have a 2018 Specialized Enduro with 170 mil RockShox area and it recently started making squidgy noises. No, no, no. Is it a sign that I should be servicing the fork or is it normal? Well, squidgy noises. Depends what you mean by squidgy noises. When oil, especially when it's kind of in what we call an emulsion damper, that means when the air and oil isn't separated, when it's being drawn through valves, it can squelch and squidge and it is completely fine. It's just a characteristic of that suspension unit. Sometimes it can become a bit worse. And when it gets really bad, especially on rear shocks where it's not an emulsion damper, what happens? what's happened then is that often some airs burped around the IFP or something like that. And so you just, you know, there is no place for air in that damper. But on an emulsion damper, such a, like a more open bathy style damper, 
similar to the one on the Rockshox Yari, it is normal. But I want you to think, and actually this is a great idea, the Yari is a really good fork with that motion control damper to start, a, <coughs> excuse me, to start experimenting with in terms of fork setup because you basically have a plunger that sits above a pool of oil, okay? Now, sometimes this oil can migrate to the lowers. It, the, the feel is largely dictated by oil level. So if yours is a little bit, a bit lower and then it gets shaken up, the fluid's aerated. So it's just gonna, those bubbles passing through the port are gonna be the thing giving your squelchy squelchies. So um, I think it sounds like a great idea to just look at the manuals on SRAM's website. They're very thorough, they're very good and eye up whether you think that you can do it. And um, I think you can, I reckon good luck to you. It's not that difficult. You'll be absolutely fine. You'll do a great job. And easily enough, you don't even have to take the, um, you don't really have to take the lowers off to do it, assuming that um, the oil hasn't overfilled your lowers, but you can basically check it very simply. So I think um, that sounds great. I've just signed you up to the job. Sorry about that. And last question from Timo. And they say, I thought they thought of trying an oval chainring on their cross country mountain bike, but if the clutch is on and the chainring is oval, are they not going to lose some watts because it moves the derailleur cage back and forth? As you can imagine, he's worried about going, you know, just pop, 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 pop. Well, this is a good question, but I want you to. Really, it's, I understand how easily it is to think that. It's such an obvious, immediate thought. But although the driving part of the chain ring is far bigger, it's also averaged out by the smaller part. So there will be a minute difference, but I mean minute. I think actually I've seen on Absolute Black, I think it was on their website or their YouTube page, showing them, and it, it's, it's very, very, very small because it's only how many teeth are engaged at any one time. And it's not say if you had a standard 36 tooth or you had one that went up to 38. So yeah, at one point it is, you know, a bigger gear you'd be pushing, but it also goes down to probably a 30, whatever, you know, mid, mid to low 30s. So um, yeah, it doesn't make any difference really, um, at least to my knowledge and at least what I, the, you know, videos and bits, of, uh, bits and pieces of sin. But um, yeah, I think you should be all good. I, I won't worry about that. And that is it for another week of Ask GMBN Tech. Now, if you've got your own question, get in the comments using the hashtag Ask GMBN Tech, and we will hopefully be able to feature on the show. I hope for your sake, the Doddy answers it for you, and you'll get a lot less waffle than old Gubbins over here. But either way, we shall get those questions answered. So don't be shy. Any tech question, we can do it. Let's go. Thank you very much, and don't forget to like and subscribe.